Well, I hope everybody's doing well. My name is Dr. Mizani. Welcome. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at AC Medical. I'm the Family Physician, and I've sat on two residency selection committees. I've dedicated the last uh, 20 years of what I've done to medical students and medical graduates, helping them become better residents and learning how to compete, learning ACGME core competencies, learning how to be a part of team, and to successfully complete residency and be able to practice in the United States. And I'm really happy to say that every day, 20,000 patients are, uh, are treated by AC medical alumni, and we're, we're quite proud of that. That's our biggest milestone ever. And so with that, I welcome you here. This is a really important topic that's very near and dear to my heart. These are the type of clinical rotations that uh, could be conducted in the United States as a graduate, and they entail auditions, uh, sub-internships, and PGY-1 Connect clinical sites. Of course, medical students can do some of those as well, but the options are a little bit fewer. I'm joined over here by Dr. Rosas. I see uh, a couple of our interns over here as well, our leadership interns. I want to welcome you here too. And of course, all of the uh, the AC Medical members that are here. Thank you so much for your trust and, and lo your loyalty. Hopefully you're really enjoying your membership with us. And with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, Dr. Rosas, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dr. Rosani. How are you? Doing good. Dr. Rosas has been uh, really, really great. Uh, she is uh, now rotating through our career development department and as a part of our leadership internship program that we have here. And so she's been a, um, she's been a very uh, uh, a positive help uh, to all of us. And, and we appreciate you uh, moderating this, uh, this webinar and, and our, our podcast. Of course. Thank you for having me, Dr. Mazzani. Of course, of course. And I see Dr. Parisi here too. Hi, Dr. Parisi. Hello, Dr. Mazzani. Hello. Dr. Parisi is also one of our leadership interns. And, and so it's good. Some of our interns just kind of drop in every once in a while into our webinars. It's uh, nice to see. And the reason why I'm I'm here uh, with with all of you is because I've uh, I've gone through all of these uh, challenges, and so my mission for the past 20 years has been, uh, you know, how to uh, how to pave the path a uh, little bit better, a uh, little bit smoother, a little bit more realistic. For initially started with international medical graduates, and then it grew into U.S. medical seniors and graduates, and how to get them properly prepared uh, for U.S. residency. And today's webinar is on auditions, on PGY-1 Connect clinical site, clinical sub-internships, and this is for the 2022 match. So I guess the biggest question that you should be asking yourself if you're you know, in the match right now, you're in the interview season, is what do I do during the waiting cycle? And this waiting cycle is typically right from the time that you submit your application, which this year should have hopefully been September 29th, and going all the way till match week's supplemental offer and acceptance program, which is the third week of March of next year. All of that put together is considered the interview season right up to that, including match weeks, a supplemental offer and acceptance program, because there are interviews that are happening during those, you know, that short two and a half days of, uh, of so. So until then, what should you be doing during the match interview cycle? Well, so the, the most important thing is do not sit around waiting. And I think that it's really important for you to know who are the formidable competitors. And those are really U.S. medical seniors. And most international medical graduates have not seen or worked with U.S. medical seniors. And what they're doing right now are they are doing clinical electives. They're in their fourth year of clinical rotations and they're assigned back to back clinical rotations in their fourth year of medical school. So their patient contact, there's only probably going to be two, maybe two and a half months of gap between the last clinical rotation and when the residency starts. And so you should be doing what they're doing. And, uh, and use them as an example. And so they're doing residency relevant patient contact and they're very active within the specialty that they've applied to. And the way that they do it is they apply, they've, they've set up sub internships, they've set up auditions in the specialties that they are applying to. US medical seniors apply to, maybe most of them apply to one specialty, some apply to a you know backup specialty, which works for them, for U.S. medical seniors, it does not work for international medical students or graduates. I mean, more than one specialty does not help. So what you should be doing is you should be active within the specialty of your choice. So, for example, family medicine, clinical rotations, being active with the American Academy, family physicians, Society for Teachers for Family Medicine. And this is just, you know, if you're applying to family medicine, volunteerism is another big one. And, you know, the, the, the one thing, if you're, if you're looking for a measuring stick, you need to have six interviews in one specialty by November 1st. And if you don't have that by then, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get any more, but you certainly have to seriously, seriously consider how am I going to get ready for supplemental offer and acceptance program. So don't just wait around for interviews and don't feel 
overly confident if you've secured one or two interviews. And 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 it's quite a, a common feeling amongst those with a few red flags, and then they get one interview and they feel like there's no red flags anymore, and there's no uh, more a false sense of security than that. Uh, of course, you want to treasure and make sure that you do your absolute best in those few interviews that you have, if you only have a few interviews, but you certainly want to prepare for match week supplemental offer and acceptance program in case you do not match. Every year, if you've been a member of AC Medical, you know, I mentioned this a lot. Every year, I always see one of our members with, you know, 20, 30 interviews and they do not match. And it's that, you know, they don't rank all the programs or they don't show up to all of the interviews. They just get this this false sense of security that, you know, they got this in the bag and it's good to go and, and they get left unmatched and that's not good. So prepare and make sure that you're you're utilizing this time very effectively and to avoid this, this big gap that you're experiencing right now. If you're not in medical school as a, in either in a Caribbean medical school or, or U.S. medical school. So what we did is uh, what are some of the best ways to stay in contact with patients? And I wanted to just kind of share that with you because I want to establish the baseline of where our audience is and what are they thinking and then kind of bring in what our opinion is and our recommendations are so our audience said working on clinical trials uh, indirectly interacting with patients by reviewing the protocols and modifying the treatment plan in epic okay clinical research another audience member said i am currently active in clinical and surgical practice not necessarily clear about what type of activity they are doing. The next one said clinical electives. Another audience member said working as a general practitioner in my home country. Another, I'm currently in my F1 year in the UK. It is equivalent to uh, being an intern in the US, I, I assume. And another individual said, you know, if I start my internship in another country, so I guess they're still kind of indecisive on what to do during this time, would it look bad? Uh, we can cover those questions. Let me see. Uh, another individual said that I'm working as a senior intern in a primary care addiction clinic where I provide care to underserved populations under the guidance of an attending. And so, uh, you know, those are all good deeds. Those are those are great. And you got to make ends meet. And that's probably a, a, a normal course of you getting to the next professional level within your your medical career. However, in the United States, what matters the most is how relevant to residency is the type of experience that you're involved in. And this is a US medical residency. So patient contact is important. Leadership is important. ACGME core competencies are very important. Some of the ways that you could do this is, you know, the tried and true US clinical experiences, and they range from clerkships or electives. And these are for medical students while they're still, they don't have their degree yet. And that's very important to differentiate between clerkships, electives, and all the other type of clinicals that you see right there in front of you, because clerkships and electives, a medical student can practice a little bit of medicine without a license as a part of their medical education, especially if you're a U.S. medical student. And so states in the United States have uh, had laws and in, in what, what a medical student can and cannot do in clinics and, and when they're in front of patients, what can they say, what can they not say, can they participate in procedures? Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of policy that goes around that. So when we see a type of activity, electives or clerkships, we are going to assume that this is a medical student, which comes with a lot of rights. If we see uh, externships, that's uh, it's a it's a loosely coined term. A lot of people use this. A lot of people don't understand what it really means. You know, it's um, you know, and I can't really fully define it for you either. In in my experience, what I believe that an externship is is if it's not an internship, it's it's something outside of a residency, but it kind of looks like residency. And uh, and of course, that comes with with its own set of, of challenges, because if it's kind of like residency, first year residency, but it's not, then, you know, can you really be legally doing all of those if you don't have insurance, if you've not been processed properly? What are you saying to the patients? You know, how do you get a really good experience with, you know, without getting in trouble with the law? There's a lot of things that comes with that. Then you have the really high quality type of clinicals, and, and it's really because of the, the, the supervisors that are involved and who is, who is surrounding you. So typically externships are, you know, maybe with a private practitioner. It could be inpatient, it could be outpatient, but it's usually a, a private practitioner that has agreed to, you know, kind of take you under their wings and bring you into their clinic and, 
either you know charge you and not charge you. Uh, it just remains to be seen. It's it's all over the place. But it typically does not have insurance, which is a big problem because nobody in clerkships and electives would ever do. No medical school would ever put their students in a clinical site without any uh, professional liability insurance. Yet. A lot of these externships, unfortunately, are uninsured, and a lot of these physicians are unaware that this is a problem. Then you have the auditions, and then you have the sub-internships, and under that comes the postgraduate sub-internship. And those, you are supervised by either graduate medical education or a program director or residency faculty under the auspices of graduate medical education or under the auspices of the program director, him or herself. And those are usually really, really high quality, and they are high yield because you know, of course, you're going to get a great experience and, and uh, you're going to really be challenged because you're going to have to do a lot. And we're going to cover that in, 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 uh, in a few slides down the line. So I don't want to give away too much of the story. But suffice it to say that auditions and postgraduate sub internships are probably the best things you could be doing during the interview season and even before the interview season, kind of leading up to that. Then you have PGY1 Connect clinical sites. Auditions and sub internships are not plenty. They're not all over the country. As you could imagine, not every program director is going to want to take the risk of bringing in somebody who's a medical graduate and they've never seen before. And so to find program directors to really offer postgraduate sub internships or auditions, true auditions, is, is quite tough. So what we've done is we've identified, you know, we put together about 13 years of data here at AC Medical and we've tracked our, our alumni, as I mentioned, you know, 20,000 patients are treated by by our alumni every year. These are these are our res residents now, they're licensed practicing physicians in the US and really globally now. But what's happened is we've tracked where our members have secured interviews and matched. We've linked that to the clinical site where we offer clinical rotations. We look at the private practitioner or the physician who is willing to sponsor our, our member, our rotator at their facility and they're connected with that institution that offered an interview or matched one of AC Medical rotators there. And so if you look at our, our clinical search engine, my clinicals, when you look online there, you'll notice that our clinical sites, each one of them says how many interviews, how many matches, and it will say PGY1 Connect. And as soon as you see PGY1 Connect, you'll see that that's, that's what that is. Then you have high quality observerships and you have clinical volunteerism. You know, those are just some of the things that you certainly would be, uh, would be good to uh, stay in contact with patients. There are some healthcare related activities, you know, unlicensed medical assisting. Uh, I, I think there's one state that requires a license. I think it's Washington, but uh, I haven't checked that. Don't take my word for it. But for right now, medical assistance and majority states do not need to be licensed. Then you have Scribe and, and Scribe does not need to be licensed either. So those are kind of, uh, you know, they're again, not fully defined as, as we speak. However, there's a lot of laws that goes around what a medical assistant can do and what a scribe can do. And unfortunately, in residency applications, those lines get crossed a lot. And so, and some physicians pay you for this and some physicians don't. I, I, my opinion is don't stay anywhere for more than four weeks uh, unless you have a job there and you've been offered a position and it's something that's going to lead you closer to the specialty you're applying to. If you're applying to pathology, do not be in a family medicine clinic and vice versa. Just don't do that. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then there is licensed activity. There's assistant physician in Missouri. There's a couple of other states that are also offering that. It's not the best option. Uh, just kind of keep that in mind. There's LPNs, um, licensed practicing nurses, registered nurses, physician assistants. Not many people really fall under. We do have a lot of registered nurses. We do have some assistant physicians who are medical graduates that uh, have just recently graduated and they can get a kind of a, a you know, a, a limited license in those states to practice, but they have to be under the supervision of, of, a, of a physician in that state. Uh, but there's other challenges that comes in with, with ERAS. But those are some of the things you could be doing. And if you're an AC medical member, you know, please, I, I invite you to come to my office hour so we can discuss this these a little bit more in detail. What typically does not count as patient contact are masters, research, and shadowing. And of course, if you have any questions with regards to uh, these, then we can certainly talk about this a little bit more. So let's talk about sub internships and residency auditions. I decided to put these together because almost all postgraduate sub internships are really auditions. And what is an audition? Audition means that you are going in front of decision makers of, of varying degrees of power, and you are showcasing your clinical skills in front of them as a part of their team, right? That's when you're auditioning. Now, 
you could audition with a single decision maker, let's say a program director or an associate program director. It could be the designated institutional official, which is above the GME, graduate medical education, and all the residencies essentially fall under GME office. And GME office is supervised by an institutional official, DIO. So if you're rotating with that individual, that will be an audition. But rotating with those individuals doesn't necessarily mean that you're in, you've been processed through graduate medical education. So you have sub internships. If it is a sub internship, then you have been processed through graduate medical education. If it is a residency audition, you may or may not be processed through graduate medical education, but you're certainly in, in uh, direct contact with decision makers at that uh, graduate medical education. So that is a residency audition. You're, you're really going in there to interview by way of clinical skills, by way of, uh, of interacting with with all the other residents uh, who are there doing their daily activities. And you know, if, if you did not watch our webinar that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago with our resident selection committee panel, where we had a family medicine program director, Dr. Diaz, we had a transitional year program director, Dr. Atut, and we had Dr. Ali Atut, who was an anesthesiology uh, resident selection committee team member. And they all came and said that, look, we want to see when we see you in rotations with us, especially during, if we know that you're applying to us, we're going to take you a lot more seriously. And they all categorically recommended doing some sort of rotations with them. Not all of them offered it. Not every, all the residency programs love it when, when there are auditions, but there's, you know, there's very few availabilities, but you know, of course we changed that. We have special, you know, agreements with various clinical sites, which then we extend to you. Um, typically the ideal duration is four weeks and most of the sub-internship clinical sites, and really what I'm talking about right now, majority of them that we're speaking of is postgraduate sub-internships. We're going to focus our, our medical graduates here because majority of people that are here are medical graduates. And if you're not you're going to be graduating soon, if there's any gap, of course, you have to think about how am I going to fill those gaps. And so with our postgraduate sub-interns, the minimum is four weeks. You don't want to do two weeks uh, with, uh, with decision makers. There's just not enough time. And four weeks is good. And a lot of them, you'll be surprised. They don't really want to, um, not all of them, some of them do not want to see a candidate for more than four weeks because they feel that because these are such limited quantity and, and uh, just uh, niche availabilities that they want it to be available to more people. And so uh, yesterday we had um, uh, one of our members that wanted to do 12 weeks of audition and the, the program director refused. And he said, look, I, I, maximum I feel comfortable with this is, is uh, 30 days because then it's going to take uh, opportunities away from others who are who, who could have a chance here and i get it because their job isn't is to you know they'll they'll be able to know you know within a couple of days whether this is a good fit or not but four weeks is what they need and not anything more than four weeks is is a little bit overkill however what they do want to see as far as duration is they they do like to see if they offer different audition opportunities like let's say with an inpatient and without patient if they have different teams across the hospital, across town. They do want to get different teams' opinions about you, all linked to that particular specialty. So my recommendation is if you can put together a total of four mixture of postgraduate sub-internship auditions, maybe a PGY1 Connect to control costs a little bit. And if you do four of those clinical blocks, that's about 16 weeks, you are well on your way to securing hopefully three to four performance-based letters of recommendation, and also filling in a six-month gap with four months of, of U.S. clinical experiences that are very high yield. How will it impact my odds of successfully securing entry into a residency program? Well, again, if you take a look at the webinar that was just posted on our YouTube channel, it's youtube.com forward slash AC Medical Org. If you watch that, it's the Resident Selection Committee panel watch that please and they will tell you that they've selected candidates directly from as a result of them auditioning with them uh, and if you want to take a look at uh, online as well on on my clinicals if you go to for example any of our postgraduate sub internship sites that we have you'll notice uh, that the uh, uh, you know it's it's well over 40 ac medical members that have matched nearly 80 uh, interviews if not more uh, at these facilities so so very very powerful and it's one of the best ways for you to overcome some of your red flags. And if you time it right, hopefully you'll start your postgraduate sub-internship before you receive a rejection from that program, right? So you kind of want to be very careful applying too early to that program and then 
going there to do an audition because it's going to be very hard you know to deal with a, a rejection and then showing up that's going to be pretty uncomfortable so speak with us and then we'll kind of help you out a little bit with uh with when you should apply to them and maybe you should just kind of wait until before you uh you start your audition or postgraduate sub internship before you apply but but every case is different i don't want to make a blanket statement uh, are there programs that will sponsor a visa yes and you know they 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 don't display this on their websites i i spoke with a program director the other day and uh he said that as of this year, they're going to uh, sponsor visas. He has an internal medicine rotation uh, clinical side with us. People audition for his transitional year with us. He helps with, with PGY2s, uh, but, but he's decided that as of this match cycle, they are going to sponsor visas, but that is not something if you call the program, they're not going to say yes. Uh, but he did tell me in uh, private that they are going to be doing that. A uh, number of candidates and applicants that got PGY1 positions during the audition, and you can see this uh, very clearly. Uh, actually, I should probably just actually kind of show you this. Let me go over here uh, with you. And by the way, our, our website is going to change uh, hopefully within uh, within a week. We've been working on it for about five years, so we're going to be saying goodbye to this website very soon. But uh, for the purposes of this webinar, I'm just going to go ahead and show you this. For example, let's go ahead and take a look over here and we'll look at, okay, let's go to, let's say Larkin, for example. I think that's one of, uh, that's a really good, yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so here we're just going to go ahead and type in uh, Larkin and then they're right here down in Miami, Florida, and there's a bunch of clinical sites that we have here. So for example, you take a look at this cardiology, uh, internal medicine in South Miami, Florida, there has been 74 matches. There have been 49 interviews. I mean, the number of interviews is probably double that, if not triple that. I mean, we've got, you know, there's almost 80 matches there at this, uh, you know, the facilities that are linked to here. And the facilities linked to here are Larkin Community Teaching Hospital in, in South Miami. And uh, so you can you can see over 10% of Larkin's residents and fellows are from AC Medical. That's, uh, you know, it's almost 15%. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very high number. And this, we've achieved this over the past six years. So this is a very, very powerful way for you to, um, to get in and, and uh, do it officially, not have to hide and be processed properly we support you throughout the process and uh, of course you could read the reviews as well i really recommend that you take a look at our reviews and see what other people have said this has taken a lot of work on our site to go ahead and display all of this for you so you can take a look but it's a lot of fun reading and very very recent this one is as recent as uh, july 30th and so take a look at those and, and you could uh, really understand what people's experiences have been during these uh, sub internships and, and auditions so hopefully that I answered this. We answered the question on duration. How will it impact my odds of successfully securing entry and residency program? I think that we've answered that question as well. This one was a really good question. Do you have any data that shows positive outcomes from auditions or sub internships? Of course, you know, I showed what has happened here at AC Medical. You can take a look at the webinar that we've had with the resident uh, selection committee panel. But then on top of that, the 2021 program director survey by NRMP, which is publicly available. Auditions are endorsed by 44.8% of all program directors with an importance of 4.2. Now, just for comparison, research was at 41.1 with an importance of 3.6. An importance of 4.2 is right there, same importance as letters of recommendation. Same importance, if not more important than USMLE Step 1. Same importance as CK. So you can just kind of tell uh, you know, how important this is. Now, 44.8% of program directors endorse it, meaning that they will look for it in ERAS applications. So hopefully that answers that question as well. Uh, how do you sign up for audition rotations? Through AC Medical. And uh, you know you can go online, like I showed you. When you go online and you can, uh, when you find your, uh, your rotation, again, this website is gonna change, but I'm just gonna do it for the purposes of this webinar. You're going to go ahead and add it to cart and then your card is available and then you review your booking and you put in your information you select your dates and then we take it from there we will contact you and and assist you with uh, with the enrollment process and so it's very very simple and it's even going to be easier on our on our new website you can even uh, uh, enroll on demand uh, on the new website and, and make the payment and, and upload documents everything back to back to back very very rapid process 
next question is I've not seen them on any website. Like you can apply for sub eyes via via SAS. Yeah, well, um, we we do a lot of um, you know we, we we like to say here when we say we make doctors, we really mean it. Our our negotiations with clinical sites is is you know it's very very personal, and uh, and they do pretty amazing work with us. They allow us some incredible opportunities, and they love AC Medical uh, members. We really pick our members pretty well. And you know it's uh, it's it's good that you don't see it anywhere else. You can you can utilize uh, AC Medical, and we will set these up for you. What's the magic number of audition rotations? How many rotations do you recommend? It really depends on what your budget is. Uh, auditions are expensive. Uh, you're looking anywhere from if not if it is not on promotion. I think we actually have a couple of auditions that are on promotion. Motion. Uh, if it is not on promotion, you're probably looking at about eight hundred to you know eleven twelve hundred dollars per week. When it is on promotion, I think we have. Uh, one of these auditions, which is probably closer to uh, about six hundred dollars per week. So, uh, you know, it depends on what your budget is. You know, four weeks of that, uh, if you want to be seen by more decision makers at different residency programs, and of course, you add you know one month for each residency program, and you go from there. Magic number, I, I think uh, it really depends on what is available at that clinical site. If they have both inpatient and outpatient, then eight weeks, uh, four and four. If it is just outpatient, then then four weeks. Uh, if it is fully inpatient, let's say there's two inpatient teams, two different residency programs, same specialty, I would I would take you know whatever I can get. So if it's four weeks at one, four weeks at another, I would absolutely do it. If I can even if I can squeeze in eight weeks, let's say I do four weeks now, and then I do if there's nothing else available and you know I can afford it, then I would probably come back again for another four weeks right before the rank quarter list is submitted. It's all about being right there in front of them so that you know you're not out of sight, out of mind. And if you're especially there during the interview season, it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, if they really like you and they, they don't give you an interview, that's, that's kind of odd. Uh, most people that are like, they do get interviews at, when they're auditioning during these times. So uh, what would a clinical audition add for me? I think we've answered this. Would the audition secure me an interview with the hospital or is it for post-interview? You know, there's a lot of different uh, benefits of doing really high quality clinical experiences. Number one, it looks fantastic on your ERAS. Number two, you, you begin to understand what the healthcare system is like and how do you perform within teams, within healthcare systems. A majority of my clinical rotations that I did when I was in medical school, my medical school was in the Caribbean, majority of them were, were set up through private practitioners. And with private practitioners, they're always just nice to you, right? They're constantly nice to you. And, you know, they take you out to dinner and they, you know, pharmaceutical rep uh, meetings and, you know, you're just, you know, they, they drive you around. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. But when you're in a postgraduate sub-internship, right, you're, you're amongst residents and you're right there with, with the program director, you can forget it. It's none of that. It's like the real thing. And so I wish I had a lot more of the real thing. And so I think, you know, it, it's, it's not just you securing interviews, but it's really building your confidence up so that you know how to, how to answer questions in interviews. If, you know, if they're, you know, to, to how to deal with them, wondering whether you understand what the U.S. healthcare system is about. So number one, that's the most critical thing that it's going to provide you. It's going to really give a really good foundation so that you you sound familiar uh, in your application and in your interview. It gives great content to your ERAS and your personal statement. And then your letters of recommendation. There's so much that could be done. You know, some of these uh, the audition supervisors uh, even say, look, go ahead and draft something and let me take a look at it and I'll add my my parts to the letter of recommendation, which if they say that, then then it's a pretty incredible opportunity for you to, you know, really think about the ACG and core competencies that you learned and and kind of bullet point those items for the for the letter writer so that you know you you have a, a letter of recommendation that you could be pretty proud of and you can even frame and put it up in your your room and 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 of course share it with the residency programs and you know so letters of recommendation is another but then again of course interviews uh which which is good but i certainly don't want you to just focus on one program to get an interview I, i'd like for you to have these high quality clinicals so that you know hundreds of programs across the country would be impressed but of course you know, an interview is excellent. And a lot of our auditioners do get interviews as a result and, and, and some match. Will that help if a candidate, if they've been out of school for 20 years, you know, if you've been out of school for 20 years, you kind of don't have a choice but to do auditions and postgraduate sub-internships because, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to get an applicant who's been out of medical school for 20 years. And I'm not sure what you've been doing during these 20 years, but it's hard not to, to make sure that that application doesn't look aged. And so if we can, uh, you know, if you can, if you can make sure that you rejuvenate your application with these really high quality clinicals, and then hopefully there's going to be an opportunity, but that in person, the one-on-one -on -one is, uh, is, is really critical because that's when they'll get to see your clinical skills and, and they'll see a whole other side of you. 
And don't be afraid if you've been out of medical school for 20 years. Dr. Diaz, in our selection committee panel that we spoke with, he said that he likes to have a mixture of, you know, candidates with a little more wisdom and, and younger candidates. He said that the balance is really nice and he really enjoys having that. Uh, he doesn't want all of his candidates, uh, his residents to be a little bit of a higher age. And uh, he doesn't want all of them to have just graduated from a medical school either. And so I thought that that was a very wise approach by him. And uh, they surely shared that uh, with, with all of us. And specifically, what are the differences between sub from uh, from from pre preliminary uh, residency positions? Okay, uh, two completely different things. Uh, preliminary residency positions are actually residency positions. They're one-year residency positions that are designed for those that have already matched into an advanced specialty. So that's what a preliminary is for. Preliminary is like transitional. Transitional is for matched candidates into an advanced specialty, such as, uh, you know, PGY2 and maybe uh, rad onc or interventional radiology or uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, neurology, anesthesiology, you name it, uh, dermatology. Uh, so there's a lot of those PGY2s. And if and so you, you apply for prelim and transitional or and or transitional and a PGY2 all at the same time in the same match cycle. Your prelim starts next July. The advanced starts the July following. You double match at the same time. That's what it's all about. Sub internships just means that Hey, I'm, I'm being processed in partnership with the graduate medical education department. They know that I'm coming. I'm processed there. I become a part of their residency teams and I work. I mean, I get in, I get co-assigned patients. I show up at five o'clock in the morning. You know, it doesn't matter if there's COVID or not. You know, I get geared up. I wear my PPE. I round, I pre-round, I post-round, I go on calls. I mean, that's, that's, that's a postgraduate sub-internship. So it's very similar to what you would be doing as a PGY1, but you're really doing it to showcase your skills to that program that you're really interested in, but also to the entire country saying, look, if you give me an interview, I'm worth it because I've done all of these experiences. I'm going to, I'm, I'm not the type that's going to come in and expect you to teach me everything. I'm going to come in and I'm going to contribute to your program. So those are the, the differences uh, just for the purposes of answering this question. Any additional questions you have, please go to acmedical.org forward slash PGSI. We have a lot of details there about auditions, about postgraduate sub internships, which is uh, quite uh, beneficial. PGY1 connects. I talked about this a little bit. These are clinical sites that are linked to interviews and matches here at AC Medical, nowhere else where we can only track our own data. But certainly we've had thousands of members that have gone through our organization. We've had, you know, thousands of, of positive match outcomes and, and we just link them back to our clinical sites. And uh, it's, it sounds simple, but it's been a 14 year project ever since 2007, since we, uh, we started Ameri Clerkships. And so, you know, PGY1 Connects are a really good way, cost-effective way to be in clinical sites that are linked to where other AC Medical members have received interviews and matched into. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go right into the hospital. You're going to be working with the residents or, you know, uh, you may, you, you very well may, but those are postgraduate sub-internships or auditions. PGY1 Connects are with Either it could be a postgraduate sub well, definitely postgraduate sub internships are PGY1 Connect, auditions are PGY1 Connects, but PGY1 Connects by themselves could also be clinics that are affiliated with a teaching hospital and that attending physician could have a lot of influence on, on the selection committee, or it could just be somebody who, who has a lot of affiliations with, with residency programs where our members have been successful in. So take a look at this and on our website, you can literally click to search for PGY1 Connect clinical sites and it will come up and I'll just show you here for purposes of an example, let me go ahead and X out of this cart. You can go back to search and, and you know, in our new system, it's kind of similar to this, but you just click on PGY1 Connect, you search, and there they are. So you see that uh, that label there. So in this facility for endocrinology, internal medicine, it's a 100% rating. There have been four reviews, 100% secured letters of recommendation. And this is a PGY1 Connect clinical site. And some of them, look, it's, it's as low as $270 per week. So you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. Uh, you know, this is probably what, uh, you know, four times this would, would probably be one week of a postgraduate sub internship, maybe 3.5 times this. So from a cost benefit perspective, it's a really good way of, of kind of getting in there and staying active and, and not breaking the piggy bank. So you can look at these number of interviews and matches and just search this. There's 150 of them. So this one, obviously more expensive, 929 per week, but 49 interviews and 74 matches, you know, and uh, so just keep looking, going through every single one of these until you find the one that you like and you can add it to cart and you can book it right there. All right, let's see. The next question with regards to PGY1 Connect duration, uh, this ranges, majority of them are four weeks. There are some that would allow two week rotations, but the majority of them almost are gonna be four weeks. 
in PGY1 Connect, there are going to be options, some of the clinical sites where you could stay there a little bit longer. There's very few cases I could make why it's okay to stay in a clinical site for more than four weeks. I can make a lot more cases why you should not stay in a clinical site for more than four weeks. But, uh, you know, try to keep it to four weeks, no more than that, no less than that. You could even get PGY1 Connects in a live online and or in person. So keep that in mind. How will it impact my odds of successfully securing entry to a residency program? I think, you know, it, with PGY1 Connects, there's less direct interaction with decision makers. It is not necessarily an audition unless it's a PGY1 Connect and audition together. PGY1 Connect and PGSI, postgraduate sub internship. If it is just PGY1 Connect, then you're not with a program director. You may not be with residents, but you're with a uh, with an attending physician who's linked to these teaching sites. So how will it include the odds of uh, successfully securing entry into a residency? I can use myself as an example. I secured my residency position during match week's uh, scramble, it was what it was called. My mentor, uh, he was the former chief of, of Morehouse Family Medicine, where I ultimately graduated from as well as the chief resident. And so he picked up the phone and he spoke with the program director. Uh, he's a private practitioner at that time. And he, he spoke with, with him about me. And, and there you go. You know, 10 minutes later, I had an offer. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that these individuals, these attending physicians that have a, you know, that they, they have a, a gravity towards doing things that get us into residency that could they could really move rocks and, and mountains if if they want to but again it's not an audition so kind of keep that in the back of your mind so benefits of it uh, we've already discussed if you want more information please go to pgy1 connect acmedical.org forward slash pgy1 connect or again you could go to our website and uh, book it and one of our uh, wonderful leadership interns are going to contact you so to help you uh, book those clinical sites. How will U.S. clinical experience improve odds of securing an, an offer uh, during uh, SOAP? This is, this is a really good question. Uh, during supplemental offer and acceptance program, how will it help during match? Uh, what percentage of students and graduates obtain a residency placement after the auditions of internship? And what are the chances of being accepted into a program after doing an audition? That's, these last two questions are repetitive, but uh, you know, let's, let's answer the, the question right up on top and link it directly to supplemental offer and acceptance program. Uh, there's, uh, we're going to have a webinar on SOAP. It's going to be uh, in, a, in, in about three weeks, but kind of, uh, you know, fast forwarding just a little bit. The only things that you can change during supplemental offer and acceptance program are your letters of recommendation, your personal statement, and uh, your, your medical student performance evaluation. That's it. You can't change anything else. And one of the most commonly asked questions, whether it's through, you know, when you have a, um, an offer uh, or, or to get to receive a phone call during match week, from the 45 programs that you apply to is what are you doing right now? They will ask you about your clinical experiences in the United States. Clinical experiences, it's not that, hey, I got clinical experience, you know, what is this gonna do for me? Clinical experience is a must. That's just, that's how it's done. If you're, you think about a US medical student, you they go through medical school for basic sciences, latter two years is clinical clerkships, clinical experiences, then they, they apply during their fourth year and they get into residency. It's a part of the process. So it's not that, you know, uh, it's not that how is this going to improve? It's what are you not going to get if you don't have it? And that's what these programs are trying to figure out. They're not trying to figure out the positive. They're trying to figure out, they're trying to sniff out people that are going to, you know, that they could potentially bring in and they're going to find out that this person has, you know, next to zero experience and they have to teach them everything from beginning. And that's a very, very disappointing position for a program to be in when they've had opportunities to invite others into their program and they just missed it. They just completely overlooked the fact that this individual did not have a clinical experience. And those individuals typically get kicked out of residency. And that is a very, very horrible position to be in. And again, not a subject of this meeting, but it is a very real problem. It affects almost 2,000 residents every year. And so again, we just don't want you to be in a situation like that. So there's a lot of benefits into filling your, your, your months leading up to July. It improves your confidence. It improves your interviews. You can add new letters of recommendation for programs that you have not submitted for letters of recommendation to, and you fill that gap and your personal statement, you can improve it by, by talking about these clinical experiences. It's a great way to show your commitment to the specialty you're applying to. And let's say you made a mistake during the match cycle and you apply to, you know, two or three different specialties and you have letters of recommendation from all specialties you could imagine, except the one that you applied to, let's say family medicine. And that this is a really good opportunity to really rebuild uh, your approach and your strategy, thinking about what's going to happen during supplemental offer and acceptance program with some strategies from us 
uh, you know, going through some data, personalizing it to you, knowing what type of specialties are going to be most commonly there and helping you kind of navigate through that. And, and also with, with SOAP, at least at AC Medical, you know, if you're preparing for SOAP, we're going to highly recommend that you, you enroll in our SOAP membership. And when you're in our SOAP membership, if you're unsuccessful in securing an offer and matching during supplemental offer and acceptance program, then we will, we will pay for your next year's membership with us 100% into a match certified, which uh, with that membership is going to be changed to a residency entry. We're going to pay for that, that entire membership for the next match cycle because we don't want you to miss SOAP. And by the way, I matched through SOAP, a scramble. I, I had mentioned it to you. It's, it's called SOAP now. I had seven offers on the table and I, and I took the one that was closest to Atlanta because I wanted to be around my mentor. So that's how it will, it will help you during SOAP. And then how can we stand out during auditions or sub-internships? What a, what a great question. Let's say if you have an opportunity to do a postgraduate sub-internship, not with a program director, let's say with a residency team, and then do a uh, audition with the program director. I think that would be really, really good because whatever mistake that you're going to be making, it's better to not do that in front of the program director, right? Get your feet wet amongst the entire team, uh, kind of, you know, take your time, kind of slowly starting, you know, getting into the groove. Inpatient is a little bit slower unless there's a massive, you know, admission wave like, you know, we had with COVID, several of those waves. But once you go into an audition, let's say with the program director in his outpatient clinic or her outpatient clinic, it is fast paced and it's really easy to make mistakes. So you kind of want to be prepared and don't just walk in thinking that I'm just going to do one month. I haven't done any clinicals, you know, for the past one year, two years, I'm just going to go right, right in and I'm going to rock it. It doesn't work like that. Maybe you should even do maybe a PGY1 Connect, not post schedule sub internship, not audition before you do that one month audition, because you only get one chance uh, to leave that impression. And they're going to, you're going to immediately leave it in that first week, the first meeting that they have with them, the first time that you, you go in and uh, you take a history from a patient, how fast you are, how efficient you are, how do you present all of those will make a difference. And so I recommend that, you know, maybe if, if again, financially, if you can afford it, get everything out of your system, maybe in a private practice, we can, you know, don't spend that much money, maybe something just a little bit under $300 a week while it's on promotion right now. And then immediately after that, do your auditions and postgraduate sub internships. And, and you still have time being where we are right now, the closer you're going to get to November and December, the less time you have to do that. And then the strategy has to change in that situation. Then we don't have the opportunity to kind of Get, them, get the mistakes out of your system. You're going to have to go right in and audition, which again, it, it, everybody's going to be a little bit different. Uh, tips on how to impress the residents and program directors. You know, be yourself, be respectful, be clean, be on time, be professional, and have respect not just for residents and program director, but the, the, the entire staff, even for the janitor at the program, you know, they, they, they're watching, they, they're, they're seeing how you interact with the secretary at the, at the, at the clinic. They're seeing, you know, whether you, uh, you keep asking to go inside the hospital where this is an outpatient rotation, they see all of that. Uh, they, they immediately will, will make decisions about uh, where your priorities are and, uh, and do you really understand why you're there for. So I think that a lot of this comes with just, you know, the type of personality that you have. Don't be too aggressive. But at the same time, don't be, uh, you know, passive, but, you know, confidence is important and, and, and a lot of experience is important before you go in front of residents and program directors. I think impressing residents is harder than impressing program directors because residents are, are very powerful in residency programs. They are so powerful and, uh, and program directors listen to them. And so you got to, you got to understand what makes certain residents tick. And these residents are very smart. They're very astute. They've been exactly where you are just a couple of years ago. And so they know what's up. So just get a lot of experience before you get in front of them. Uh, how can we maximize the audition or sub, uh, sub I opportunity in terms of performing well, networking, possibly receiving interviews at that uh, same institution, et cetera. One of the things that I do with our members, number one, become a member of AC Medical and, and don't go for anything less than a residency prep membership. Residency prep covers your professional liability insurance with us. Here, let me just go ahead and show this to you really quick. Become a residency prep member. Once you do, then we will walk you through residency prep member. Then I will uh, walk you through ACGM and core competencies, and then we prepare you for the upcoming clinical rotations. Uh, and if you sign up for 12 weeks, we will pay for the fee of that membership. If you want ERAS assistance and personal statement assistance and the residency strategy session beforehand, then you want to consider the uh, the match certified membership, and so you want to you want to do that. 
and then if you want to have mock interview in there then then you want to consider the the one on the right so you know match certified is is going to be you know changed to residency entry and and this is going to be residency entry with mock interview so that that's the first step that you got to do so the best way to really perform well is understand how you're going to be evaluated and it's going to be by acgm and core competencies and once you understand what core competencies are and how to apply yourself to core competencies and how to apply core competencies to yourself and how do you prepare for you know build and earn that letter of recommendation based on these acgm and core, core competencies then you're on the right track so speaking the same language as they do uh, you know having the same priorities as they do and understanding what they are is is the way to stand out and for all of you that are here and have had interviews you know one of the best things i just you know we're doing all of this to help you get interviews right and if you have that interview then we want to really want to make sure that you do really good in it because we want to make sure you get ranked so the process is uh, you get you you get you know secured an interview. You secure that interview, then you perform well in the interview. Now you gotta try to get ranked. Just because you showed up to the interview doesn't mean that you're gonna get ranked. And each program ranks. Let's say they have 20 spots. They may rank up to 200 people that they interview. And so you don't want to end up at number 200 or you know 175. You want to be as close to you know number one to 40, right? You want to be somewhere along those lines. And the way programs become unfilled during match week is. They've exhausted everyone on the rank order list and they did not match all of their positions. And that's how these programs become unfilled. So interview prep is critical. And we offer, you know, a one question interview prep for free. And so if you go to that website in front of you, you'll get to see how you can do that. But we have two different types of interview preps. One is an interview boot camp. The other one are mock interview packages. And so the mock interview packages essentially are you pick, you know, 10 or 20 questions out of a question bank of about 250. And then I'll meet with you and we'll go through each one of the questions and we'll work on your responses. We'll record the whole thing. You'll watch the whole thing. And then you'll have an interview bootcamp with me, which is uh, typically is 30 minutes. You could upgrade it to 75 minutes and then you have recording of all of that. And so the interview bootcamp is a lot more faster pace. It's a single session. I will select the, the questions and you won't know what they are. And, you know, we just rapidly go through them. I provide some feedback, but again, as you can imagine, you know, 10 questions is probably going to take, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, with some feedback, then we're going to be pretty close to 30 minutes. We are offering for the first time an interview bootcamp with program director. It is only available in 30 minutes, very limited availabilities. This is a real program director that has agreed to, um, to, to offer uh, an interview bootcamp. So I strongly recommend that you take advantage of that. And you can certainly sign up for these on acmedical.org forward slash services forward slash interview prep. So with that, I want to thank all of you for, for coming over here. And I'd like to open the floor if there's any questions in the chat session or if anybody would like to go ahead and uh, uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you and I can uh, speak with you. All right, let's see. What are the chances of getting an interview from the program after doing an audition retention? Look, these auditions that we have, we have a track record of our of our rotator securing interviews and matching into those programs. You know, if this was something that you're just setting up an observership, let's say a Cleveland clinic, who knows what the chances of something like that are. These places that we have auditions and postgraduate sub internships in, they have themselves. Again, you can take a look at the webinar. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the directors themselves. Their mission is to take AC Medical members into their residencies as a result of their auditions, at least half of them. And, and they said that. It's not my word. That's what they said. So that's what they do. They look at this as a, an incredible alternative to having to review three, 4,000 applications. What better way than to see our candidates right there in front of us with, within our entire teams? And so these are very, very effective ways in securing interviews and a match. And, and again, you can take a look at each one of the clinical sites and it will say how many people have secured interviews and how many people matched in there. So for your particular situation, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, nobody can tell you what are the chances. The chances are great. And if you're in an audition, you are interviewing there. I don't care what they call it. They are interviewing you. That's a, it's a live physical interview of your clinical skills, which of course should lead to an official interview, but your interview has started the moment you started your audition. And they know because your ID badge says auditioner from AC Medical. And, uh, and, and right before you go there, or as soon as you start, you will let them know that you applied to the program. Now, depending on how many red flags you have, if you have a bunch of red flags, in your situation, there's not that many red flags. But if you have a bunch of red flags, maybe you don't want to apply to them beforehand. You want to kind of start your, your audition and then you want to kind of, you know, apply then after they know you. So they won't immediately say reject. But 
hopefully that that kind of answers your question. They're, they're very, very effective. Again, take a look at the program directors on our YouTube channel, the webinar from uh, two weeks ago. I think that that'll be uh, answer uh, even a lot better than I did. All right, Dr. Ye, for anesthesiology, is there uh, rotations and are these different criteria to evaluate? Uh, I mean, I think you mean uh, your performance. Unfortunately, the anesthesiology postgraduate sub-internship audition that we had is not available. That program has been stopped, um, at least for now. But it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's um, inpatient. You're in the operating room. Uh, you're working with anesthesiologists, with nurse anesthetists. And, you know, they're, they're evaluating you just like any other auditioner there. Unfortunately, the anesthesiology postgraduate sub-internship that we had is not available. Uh, we do have surgery, postgraduate sub-internship directly with the program director and, and residents. So I, I invite you to take a look at that and great for, for that particular uh, program. But it is uh, also, we have, uh, we have one in New Jersey where you can rotate with the associate program director. And so, so those are, um, those are your, your options at the moment. We do have anesthesiology, but it's not postgraduate sub-internship or audition. Okay, uh, Dr. Raj Paul, uh, these auditions, is it for this main match or soap match for or for next cycle? It's for all of them. This is for this match. And because if you're in the interview cycle right now, hopefully you will get interviews. You, A, with doing auditions, you could secure more interviews. And also, if you have interviews, they're going to ask you, what are you doing right now? What a great thing to say that, like, you know, I'm in internal medicine, um, postgraduate sub-internship and with residents and program directors or associate program directors right now. And so the quality of, of your responses in your interview just skyrockets. So uh, it is it's for sure it is for this match cycle. And then also, I, I, I just my word to the wise, if you're in the match, you have to plan for not matching. That's what happens if you you know, if you go into the match, you've got to plan for non-matching and that supplemental offer and acceptance program. And this kind of, you know, uh, you know, hits both uh, from both angles, uh, the, the same issue, you know, worst case scenario and, and uh, best case scenarios. Is audition of family medicine and outpatient helpful? Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Again, you can see by the number of AC medical um, rotators that are matched into those programs. Every year, I would probably say anywhere between 20 to 50 percent of their match candidates are from ac medical these these sites that like at least the ones in in florida that we offer and then uh, being 23 year old graduate it's easy to get matched family medicine nothing is easy dr rash paul nothing about the match is easy i don't want you to think that at all the entire process is is a is a huge monumental challenge and the sooner you, you, you agree with that and you begin to do things that you could be compared against that U.S. medical senior, the sooner you're going to see results that you're looking for. So if you're wondering which one is easier to get into family or neurology, you and I need to talk. And, and I invite you to go to acmedical.org forward slash try us for free. Uh, I'm just going to show this to everybody here. And the reason why I say you and I need to... Uh, speak is because um you know family and neurology are so different uh with from one another but if you go to this website you can sign up for to meet with with me and, uh, and we'll give you a free office hour access pass where you can come in you can see other ac medical members it's a one-time access pass into our office hour and and i'll and i'll speak with you and we'll go over your particular situation and this is for for everybody this is our community service to to all of you so take a take a look at that and i'll be more than happy to discuss your particular situation thank you everyone we really appreciate you all being here and we really enjoy doing this we're going to have about a uh, dr rosa says it a two or a three week uh break in our let's take a look so we're going to go november to our academy 4th. sorry november 4th. november 4 is the next webinar Got it. Yeah. So everybody, make sure you always check out our residency prep academy page. And so this was today. Yeah. Our next one is November 4th. So we're not going to see you till November 4th. And uh, make sure you register for this one contacting programs during the 2022 match webinar. And so um, that's always a uh, that's always a fun webinar to have as well. We're going to walk you through. Uh, we're going to walk you through what it's like to um, to to call programs and see if you can secure interviews that way. 
and have them take a look at your application. Really, really high yield uh, webinar. So make sure that you're all there. Our pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Really enjoyed you being here. And thanks for spending your time with, uh, with us. Uh, I know it's valuable. Thanks for spending it with us. Have a good weekend, everyone. Uh, Bye-bye. And thank you, Dr. Rosas, for, uh, for helping. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Masani.